Uh, welcome, everyone. Dr. Jessica Ati and I are going to go over some critical appraisal basics for clinicians. Uh, so the topic is becoming an evidence detective, and we'll start off by doing some introductions, and then we'll get right into it. So Oh, yeah. And I just wanted to mention for those who are curious, the little picture on the side, the greatest detective cases from Vancouver's police wizard, Inspector Vance. If you're a detective or police procedural nerd, uh, you might be interested to know that there was a famous uh, uh, detective known as Canada's Sherlock Holmes, um, John F.C.E. Vance, who worked for over 40 years. So a career much like pharmacist or doctor um, or nurses, you know, who who, uh, worked very long time to hone his craft. And he was known as an expert in serology, toxicology, firearms, and, and so on. And he traveled all around the province and, and to the Yukon and uh, did some, you know, was involved with some pretty cool cases. And so today we're, we're hoping to empower all of you across the province, country, world uh, to build your detective skills so that you can kind of dig deeper in and find out the real story uh, behind the evidence. So I don't have any uh, commercial conflicts of interest. I receive honoraria from a number of different non nonprofit and academic groups. And as well, I'm a co-investigator, part of some some grants that all have to do with research into tests and medications. And I'm a family doctor, palliative care doctor. Uh, so I get paid through MSP, through uh, Island Health Authority. And then I have a small uh, a salary from the, the Therapeutics Initiative. And uh, I have no relationships with commercial interests. I am not currently participating in any grant-funded projects. I occasionally get paid to do presentations, but I only take the money if I am certain that the money that's being used to pay me does not come from the pharmaceutical industry. And that's been my policy for 19 years now. Very rarely, I'll be contacted by a group of lawyers that are representing someone that's being sued, and it involves uh, the use of medical evidence to justify the suit or defend. And so they usually contact me and ask me to provide some interpretation of medical evidence as it relates to drug harm. I don't receive any consulting fees. I am a pharmacist with Fraser Health in the Lower Mainland in BC, and I'm a researcher educator with the Therapeutics Initiative. Um, so uh, the whole program is funded um, by you, the participants. Uh, we don't have any in-kind or other financial support. Um, some of uh, the pay for the, uh, well, most of the pay for the operation of the UBC Therapeutics Initiative comes from taxpayer money through the government um, of British Columbia um, and is held by the University of British Columbia. And so we don't think there's any going to be any biases that are uh, concerning. We may have some intellectual biases, but we're going to try to present references for all the facts that we that we talk about. We want to encourage discussion. So we have some quizzes and some things we're going to be using um, Slido today, and we'll walk you through that to encourage dialogue and, and get you thinking. Um, and we're not going to recommend any specific products or, or interventions. So today we're hoping to help you take a look at clinical trials or other sources of information to guide the guide clinical practice, but do so in a format that will sort of help it translate better to conversations with patients. And there's some specific pitfalls that we thought would be good to cover today, including statistical and clinical significance, absolute and relative risk reductions, and then meaningful versus surrogate endpoint. And then last, we want, we want you to be able to use some of the knowledge when you are applying evidence that you find to your practice. So the, the reason Jessica and I chose the, the theme of becoming an evidence detective, uh, in, in our experience, this kind of work, critical appraisal, is analogous to what a detective would do or what a bad detective would not necessarily spend time on. And the idea being that if you were a detective and you're trying to solve a crime, like who who was the murderer, and you just went with your gut and you just went with the evidence that was readily apparent to you and you didn't think it through, there's a risk with that. You might end up not finding the truth and convicting the wrong person or never end up convicting anyone at all because you only did a superficial look or search for the evidence and you really didn't think it through. Whereas if you looked everywhere for all possible clues and then you took the time to assess and piece the clues together the image depicts something that you might have seen in a movie or tv show where the obsessed detective has this wall full of notes and photographs and information and has yarn connecting the pieces and is trying to sort out this uh, incredible puzzle of information that time is really really worthwhile at getting you to the truth and what we find in critical appraisal of evidence is and one of my mentors dr ken bass is, is on this workshop. He taught me that, you know, 
if it takes you hours and hours and months and months to go through even one clinical trial to, to tease out all the good information, it's time well spent. What we're going to do is suggest that you, at least for these four concepts, feel comfort in knowing that the time spent in teasing through and working through the details will make it less likely that you'll be misled, more likely that you'll get to the truth and be able to give your patients the best information so that they make good decisions about their healthcare. So we're going to be evidence detectives hopefully by the end of it. So um, we thought one way to explore this would be to have a, a real-ish case, <laughs> sort of a conglomeration, a conglomeration of, of a whole bunch of different uh, cases and people. And so this is Harvey and Harvey's older brother recently had a heart attack and he's coming into your clinical setting saying, you know, I figure I should try to be healthy and I don't want to have a heart attack or get cancer or die, you know, before I finish doing the things I want to do, like volunteering for the Habitat for Humanity working on some houses or being able to walk his dog. Um, he's got obesity, he has diabetes, and he's on metformin. He's got a bit of burning in his legs, which really limits his dog walk. But he doesn't have any other major health issues that he knows of. He's not taking other medicines beside metformin. So he has some questions. And we're going to, in a moment, we're going to get you go to Slido and help us answer these questions. And his questions are relating to some medications and some tests. He, he says, hey, my friend who's got diabetes, diabetes and um, burning in his legs. Uh, he says I should take gabapentin. Should, should I take that to help my nerve pain? He also wonders, do you think that a prostate test is a good idea for me? And he asks about a cholesterol pill. Should I be on one of those new diabetes drugs? So we're just going to um, get you to go to slido.com. You, you should be able to see a quiz of these same questions. And we know that it's going to be difficult to answer yes or no, but we've, we've only given you the option of yes or no. So you can answer your, you know, with your gut instinct, if you could only tell Harvey, yes or no, should he take that gabapentin? Should he get a, or what, do you think a prostate test is a good idea? Should we take a cholesterol pill? Should I be on one of those new diabetes drugs? And the new diabetes drugs we're referring to are like the GLP-1 or the SGLT-2 as an, as an example. And so this is just a gut thing because we're going to ask you some of these questions in different ways later. And so we're curious about where we're starting off. Sorry, when we set this up, we thought we could see them, but perhaps Olive, if you don't mind giving us a preliminary. Sure. Um, for the first question, uh, 21 uh, people said yes, 18 said no. For the second question, do you think that a prostate blood test is a good idea? Seven voted yes, 32 no. Third question, should I take a cholesterol pill? 25 voted yes and 14 voted no. Last question, should I be on one of those new diabetes drugs? 20 voted yes and 19 voted no. Okay. So one of the things is like, you know, when I have a patient in front of me and I, you know, I want to know something about, you know, I just don't know how to answer their question or there's something that I'm like, oh, I don't, what do I do for, oh, you've got rosacea. Like often I'm thinking like, oh, I wonder, you know, what the best thing is, or they might ask me a very specific question. Like, does this topical medication work really well for rosacea or something? And when I have that person in front of me, then I need to go and look for information and, and a guideline. So I'd love for you guys to type in the chat of an example of some kind of question, some kind of patient situation when a person is in front of you, a clinical question that you've had lately, a simple, you know, hey, does this work kind of a question? Yeah, should I be on Ozempic? Do SSRIs work? Does red light therapy work for bladder incontinence? Yeah, but they're like, you know, every day there's examples. One of the ones, one of our colleagues asked, should I get the new COVID vaccine? So when when a patient is in front of you, um, one of the questions that our colleague, uh, Tom Perry, asked and did a recent therapeutics initiative letter on was about ADHD medications. And, and just using that as an example, you might go to up to date or PubMed or something or got, find a guideline and, and uh, you know, look at stem cells for osteoarthritis, all kinds of, you know, people have a lot of good questions. So when you're looking these up, you know, you might find a paper and say, okay, this paper, it talks about ADHD medications. And I want to know, do they work for adults? Okay, so for adults. And when you're asking a research question, you're often taught to use the PICO format of selecting a population and intervention comparison outcome. So population, adult intervention, you know, a specific drug for AD, maybe specifically short acting drug for ADHD, the comparison might be placebo or different kind of drug. And then the outcome, like what, what is that? And often when you find a paper 
the PICO, the kind of context of everything, it may or may not line up with the patient in front of you. And Aaron's going to tell us a little bit more about breaking that down in a second. I think, you know, if you, if you're thinking like a detective, if you just go and find a paper and the conclusion says um, ADHD medications help adults who are diagnosed with ADHD, you're going to say like case is solved. Perfect. I know what to do, but it's always more nuanced than that. Of course, right. You're at a TI conference, you know, that's going to be a few more layers. And so sometimes working backwards, take Taking the paper and figuring out what PICO it actually addresses can can help you to decide, does that actually, uh, the patients in the study and what's going on with them, does that actually apply to the person in front of you? Right. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. So I found that to be the most useful beginning step. And sometimes it takes a while, but as I mentioned in the beginning, it's worth it. So thinking more about the O in the PICO question, it helps you sort out your thoughts. It helps understand how you're going to relate this to the patient's expectations or what's important to the patient. So, and again, I'm not a clinician, but when I've gone through this process with family and friends that ask me these questions, I it's an opportunity for me when I'm developing my PICO to ask the patient, well, what's important to you? Uh, what does success look like? So when you're interested in this treatment, what would success be if you took that treatment and then you, you know, what outcome are you expecting? That informs what goes into my PICO question. And then I take that list and I impose it on the evidence that I find. So like Jessica's saying, I'm looking to see if the evidence from a clinical trial that I find informs me about the outcomes that the patient thought was important. And the other thing I do is I try to categorize the outcomes in terms of preventative or symptomatic relief. So for example, if a patient is interested like Harvey in taking a statin, he's looking to prevent complications in the future. Whereas for the gabapentin, he's more probably more interested in will the gabapentin relieve his, sim- his symptoms. Now, the reason that dichotomy preventative versus symptomatic becomes important is because it helps you understand where the evidence has a role in your discussion with the patient. So what I mean is if you're trying to prevent something like the use of statin and you share that evidence from the science, from the clinical trials with the patient, how are you going to know if that patient experienced that benefit, for example, with the statins? It's very difficult or almost impossible to know if a preventative drug had the effect that was desired in the patient sitting in front of you. So the evidence from the control trials sets your expectation. One out of 25 people will not have a second heart attack if they take a statin. But when your patient comes back to you and doesn't have a heart attack, was that attributable to the statin or not? And so for preventative drugs, the evidence that you get helps you set expectations, but doesn't actually tell you, won't allow you to attribute the effect or no effect in the patient in front of you. But with symptomatic uh, treatments, the evidence that you find helps you set the expectations. How many people are likely to feel better when they take gabapentin for pain? But the best evidence of how that drug is working in your patient is what your patient tells you. So if Harvey says, I took the gabapentin and it doesn't help my pain, that's all you need to know. Or if he says, I feel much better, the pain is gone, and you reflect back on the evidence. Well, not many people are supposed to feel better on gabapentin. I wouldn't argue with Harvey. I would trust him if his pain goes away. So this exercise of thinking through the outcomes and what's important to the patient helps you uh, in incorporate the evidence in your shared decision-making process. So we're going to get you to go to Slido again. Aaron, you want to walk them through this one? Sure. Yeah. So one of the, when I've presented this information on pain relieving medications before, it's interesting clinicians will report that patients have very different ideas of what an analgesic should do. So if you get a sense that the the patient has unrealistic expectations, then you're going to be prepped on how you're going to use the evidence. And so we just want to get a sense of with your patient population, if in this gabapentin scenario, what do they typically expect? So the results are starting to trickle in there. And, yeah. and while we're just letting everyone else vote, there is a quick a question uh, in the chat. I don't know if you saw that, uh, Aaron. Uh, yeah. If patient, PM. if the pain goes away, how do you know it's a specific effect of gabapentin rather than a placebo effect? It's a good question. You don't actually know, but in some senses, I think that's irrelevant if the patient is not experiencing toxicity and can afford and wishes to continue the medication. If they're feeling better, then 
let them continue to take the medication because they're getting the benefit. Now, for things like regression to the mean or self-limiting painful conditions, I think it's reasonable as clinicians to suggest to the patient that there's a limited duration of time we think you should be on this medication. At some point in time, we should reassess and see if stepping back still allows you to function normally. And that would incorporate your clinical knowledge and not having patients stay on medications indefinitely. But it's, it's, really, it's really difficult to know for sure whether it's the drug effect or the placebo effect. Getting back to the Slido quiz, it see, this is interesting because the, the biggest response was patients expecting elimination of pain, which I think is fantastic to get that idea first, because then you can prep yourself on how you're going to explain to patients, well, you know, when you look at the evidence for things like gabapentin, it doesn't eliminate the pain. It may reduce the pain to a certain level, but only in a certain number of patients. And when you give those facts to the patient, they may say, I'm willing to take that chance that it may not help me or it may not eliminate my pain or oh, I was completely unaware that an analgesic uh, would not eliminate my pain. And, you know, it, it sets you up for getting the patient ready for what is likely to happen versus what is not likely to happen. Thank you for providing those responses. So I'm going to first talk about the difference between statistical and clinical significance. So this is in important when you're looking at clinical trials or systematic reviews. First, I'm just going to go over what, generally speaking, statistical significance tells us. Statistical significance is basically a claim that a set of observed data from a clinical trial uh, is not due to chance, but instead can, can be attributed to a specific cause. So it's a very mathematical or academic exercise in determining whether the data that was observed in the clinical trial was actually just a chance finding or real, okay? And you can find statistically significant differences, and they may not mean anything to a patient or the patient may not perceive it. Now, a specific tip for you would be when you see a randomized control trial with thousands of patients... That is likely done because the kind of effect that they're looking for is going to be small. So if the clinical effect of the intervention is small, you will need thousands of patients in your randomized control trial for that effect to surface. And that should start to tell you something about, well, if it's a large clinical trial and they're doing that because the effect size is going to be small, how meaningful will that be to my patient? Um, so statistical significance doesn't really get at the heart of that's what would success look like for the patient. So when you see statistically significant differences, the tip for you would be to, if there's no information on is that clinically important or meaningful or perceivable by a patient, you're going to have to share that effect with the patient and say, how does that make you feel? One out of 25 people will benefit from a statin, for example, and the other 24 won't. Now, as our keynote speaker suggested, when you give the facts to some people, some people will say, yeah, that those odds are good for me and, and I'm willing to take the medication. And some people will say a one out of 25 chance of benefit is not meaningful for me. And they'll say, no, I don't want to take it. Both answers are right. All we want to do is give the facts to the patients and let them make the best decision for themselves. And when you only have statistical significance, then you have to be careful and do some more discussion. For clinical significance, a change that makes a difference to a patient that can be perceived or an effect size that is enough for them is what we're more interested in. That is more subjective. What's important to a patient is going to be different from patient to patient. You want to share that information with them and they'll let you know. Some clinical trials will actually report what they've already assessed as a meaningful improvement or something that a patient could actually perceive. And we'll get into some good and bad examples. So here's an example of what's set in up to date for the treatment of neuropathic pain. For those of you not familiar with up to date, it's a, it's a tertiary reference that many clinicians, at least in Canada, I think, or North America use as a form of a, a guideline. And they talk about gabapentinoids having proven efficacy versus placebo. They say that they're effective for the treatment of post neuralgia and painful diabetic neuropathy, and they are more effective than placebo. So I would suggest that these are statements that don't really tell us if they're talking about clinically important or minimally important differences or statistically significant differences. There's a question in the chat. I assume this concept of statistical versus clinical significance is not relevant for preventative medicines. Actually, I think it is. You know, when you're when you're sharing with someone an effect size for a preventative drug like statins prevent the risk of a subsequent heart attack in one out of 25 people that receive statins, a one out of 25 chance of getting the benefit may be clinically unimportant for some, but clinically important for others, depending on other things like can they afford it? Are they experiencing any toxicity? So I think it applies to both preventative and symptomatic 
So here's a gabapentin study in patients with diabetic neuropathy. And in the conclusion, they say gabapentin monotherapy appears to be efficacious. In the main result, in the abstract, they report that the mean pain score in patients uh, was 3.9 points with gabapentin and 5.1 points with placebo patients. So they're saying there's significantly lower pain scores. What you should be asking at this point is, is the one point difference or just over one point clinically meaningful? Would a patient even notice this? And if it is meaningful, does everyone get this effect or just some people? Now that information isn't here. This is the superficial evidence that you might see as a detective. But what we're suggesting is you have to dig dig one layer deeper or maybe two layers. What the study didn't say in the abstract, but is in later in the text is they say approximately 60% of patients received gabapentin had at least a moderate improvement in pain on the PGIC scale. Now that scale asks patients, do you feel no different, much better? better, worse, or much worse. So it it gets into, do patients actually notice the effect? And this is the kind of information that you're looking for. So in this case, I'm not necessarily saying that I believe this trial, but it, it does provide some information. So this outcome captures a clinically meaningful change or a minimal difference that a patient can perceive. And you see more patients on gabapentin have a meaningful change than those on placebo. The second question is, does that apply to everyone or just some of the people? In terms of setting patient expectations, you take the absolute number of people that receive gabapentin and had a meaningful change and you subtract the number that the same number from the placebo group. So you're left with 27% more gabapentin patients will have at least moderate pain relief. And to figure out how many people you need to treat to get that benefit, you take 100 and divide it by that difference in percentage. 100 divided by 27 equals 4. So the bottom line is for every four patients that are given gabapentin, one patient will feel better, the other three won't. So this is a meaningful or perceptible improvement in pain that occurs in one out of four people that have been given gabapentin. You're going to have to share that with your patients and say, that's a minimal perceivable change in pain. There's a one out of four chance you'll get that. And that will allow the patient to decide whether it's worth them taking it or they want to try or not try at all. Here's a good example of reporting clinical significance. So the Cochrane Systematic Review on Gabapentin for Neuropathic Pain presents the data in this way. They have a summary table or the, I can't remember what it's called, but right at the beginning of the review, they report all the outcomes in a summary table. And here they talk about an outcome, any definition of substantial benefit, at least a 50% pain intensity reduction or a very much improved report by patients in terms of their pain. And they report that the number needed to treat is around 6.6 or 7. So you need to treat seven patients and one will come back and say, I feel better. So I think that's better than saying there's a one point reduction out of a 10 point pain score. And that gives you a sense of not only is a meaningful reduction in pain likely and how many patients would experience that. So you get all of that information and it's much easier to find in this particular Cochrane review than the clinical trial I reported earlier. So we, in our quiz, we also asked about his question uh, relating to PSA and good detectives asked us good questions, but you know, when Harvey is asking about, hey, do you think that prostate test is really, you know, is it a good idea? Like, what is he really asking? And is is he asking us whether PSA testing accurately detects prostate cancer? Is he asking if it's going to find prostate cancers that could be treated? Is he going to ask, will it give me treatments that lower my chance of dying of prostate cancer? Or is he asking you, what would you do? I think we heard in the, I think it was the previous session, we heard some people are saying they just, <laughs> even with shared decision making, <laughs> they're like, what will I do? I think Carolyn Canfield had a comment and saying people engage in shared decision making, but then they want to know, like, what should I decide that will help fortify my relationship with my with my NP or my or my physician or the or the pharmacist who's guiding me? So there may be other things going on here. So many the majority say he's asking, does PSA testing lead to treatments that will lower my chance of dying of prostate cancer? And that that might be it, right? He's concerned his brother died and he just he wants to see, you know, oh, I heard PSA might help me prevent dying from from prostate cancer. Maybe that's what he wants to know. All right. So if I was in the office with a patient and they had this question and I didn't know, I didn't have a good answer, I might look up, you know, what are the latest guidelines or something. And you might find the 2022 Canadian Neurologic Association recommendations, which basically about prostate cancer screening. And they say population-based screening has demonstrated benefits, including reducing prostate cancer mortality. So, okay, a simple answer. Maybe that that's all we need to know. But again, 
TI session, you know, we're going to go a little deeper. You could also look at different sources. Uh, maybe Ben Stiller could has the answer. Not sure how much I would trust it, but pretty simple. P taking the PSA test saved my life, literally. If I was looking a little deeper, I might look at uh, some of the clinical trials. And this is the ER SPC, one of the big trials for uh, PSA testing. Um, and then this was a this particular paper looked at an additional follow up um, after 11 years. So in their abstract, you know, because I don't have time to read the whole paper, uh, it says even with the additional two years, they found that PSA based screening significantly reduced mortality from prostate cancer. Okay, so everything, you know, and I could look in other places. And they would all probably say the same thing. What's interesting is that in this trial, as opposed to in the wording of the Canadian neurologic guidelines, I added, see, I added that period after prostate cancer, they actually go on to say, but did not affect all cause mortality. So we thought one of the things, you know, in the outcome section of trials you should know about is that difference between disease specific and all cause mortality. This is the same information, but in a, in a different format. So I've just blanked out a lot of content here, but basically this is the same trial, 162,000 men who had PSA screening every four years, followed for 13 years. And you can see there's one column for prostate cancer mortality. And you can see that men who died, men were less likely to die of prostate cancer in the screening group than in the control, regardless of age. And in all-cause mortality, the number is one. And that means there's no difference in the chance of dying between those the PSA testing group and the group that usual care. So let's unpack that a little bit further. When you're looking at all-cause versus disease-specific mortality, the, the difference is really like the total deaths versus the total deaths that were attributed to that specific disease. And one advantage of looking at all-cause mortality is that you know there can be harms of screening, as, as uh, Dr. Thériault alluded to earlier, right? Women get mammograms, go on to have a biopsy, maybe a surgery, they could have a post-surgical infection, sepsis, be hospitalized. I mean, that's quite rare, but whatever the possible complications are of um, chasing that screening test and all the interventions it entails will be captured in the statistic of all-cause mortality, whereas they wouldn't be in uh, disease-specific mortality. And the cause of death, you know, as a, I do a lot of palliative care and I fill out a lot of uh, medical certificates of death. And we have to put on there like what the cause of death is. And most of the time, honestly, we don't know. A person on my palliative unit who's had prostate cancer and they die, I'll probably put prostate cancer as the cause because I know they had it. Um, but they might have died of a heart attack or something else. It was just kind of the biggest, baddest disease that I knew they had. And they had a natural kind of slow decline. And so what I'm trying to say is that it's really subjective. It's open to interpretation. And in these studies, when it's a, a screening trial, there's a kind of tendency of in the, you know, if you know that the person was screened, you might attribute to their death to something else. And if you know they weren't screened, you might attribute it to, to the cancer that they weren't screened for. So there's, there can be that misattribution. And the same is true, you know, there's lots of trials of cardiovascular composite outcomes and cardiovascular more, um, events, um, or d death due to a cardiovascular event. And, and the same, the same challenges would apply there. So it's not only for screening trials. The question is, you know, does your patient really care if they die? of prostate cancer or of something else. And uh, I would say it depends on the patient. Uh, you know, I've had some patients when we're discussing screening, I say like, you're really particularly worried about dying of breast cancer. Maybe they witnessed a, a friend or loved one have a horrific journey through treatment and, and just, a, you know, and disfigurement and other things that were very distressing to them. And they might say, look, I realize that this type of screening for me may not make me live longer than I otherwise would. I might die of something else, but I would rather die of something else than breast cancer. That I think that's rare. I think most people, they just want to, like Harvey, just wants to do what they can to not die earlier than would otherwise be necessary and to live as well as possible. So I, this statistic in these trials of disease-specific mortality, it's a bit misleading uh, unless your patient is, for whatever reason, specifically interested in that. Um, this is similar to the slide you saw earlier in the in the keynote showing PSA. And we know that as we do more screening, we'll detect more cancers, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a de decrease in mortality. Many of the cancers that we find might be described as overdiagnosis or just slow cancers that, that are cancers you might die with and not from. And I think for, this is one reason why we have to be careful about how we decide whether screening or other big population intervention is helpful. 
helpful. One of the debates when when you read these arguments, um, people say, oh, we should use all-cause mortality. The people who are against this, they say, well, you know, that's too stringent a requirement. You would need like hundreds of thousands of people in, in these trials to detect the effect, the one death, actual death from all, co- you know, prevented from all-cause mortality by doing this screening. Okay, but if we have to screen 100,000 people to save one life overall, is it really worth all of the other types of ha- the hassle, the cost, the harm, the time they have to take off work or get child care or elder care so they can attend the appointments and the follow-ups? You know, I think, you know, when you're on the scale of needing to test hundreds of thousands of people, that sort of calculus may come into play, even if we could show effect. And it also ignores some of the data from other types of screening that, you know, with hundreds of thousands of people that, that show no impact on alcohol mortality. I'm just going to check the chat really quickly. I There's a few asking, interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it matters who adjudicates death and uh, Gailen <laughs> thankfully has answers that. Yeah. They, people have to be blinded and yeah, it can be a huge problem. And, and I, that's one of the challenges is, and, and it, it's not always the people in the trials who adjudicate the death. And sometimes the clinicians doing so are not blinded. In fact, most of the time they would be aware of it, you know, because the patient's having other, other ongoing care. So it, they, a lot of that data comes from from, uh, medical certifications and things like that. So yeah, it's a real challenge. And I can, I'm certain that I've made a lot of mistakes in my adjudication of cause of death because it's, it's, it's hard to do, but whether they died or not, that's black and white is pretty, pretty simple statistic. So we're going to move on to statins. Yeah, just one other comment about that all-cause mortality. It also alerts us to the possibility that interventions inadvertently may increase mortality, right? So that that just all-cause mortality is not an efficacy outcome. It's not a safety outcome. It's just you're looking to see in what direction does the intervention have an effect on mortality. So stepping back and accepting the possibility of either direction is important. So let's see the poll results. Um, Are patients concerned Considering statins concerned about these things? And then a subsequent question, do they ask about the size of the effect or the likelihood of benefit? It looks like most people are saying patients don't want to die early. So I guess it relates in a similar way to the question about analgesics. Do patients think that when they take a statin and you say it helps them prevent having a heart attack, do they think everyone that takes a statin is going to have a heart attack prevented? And the answer is, um, I don't know what people think. I would I would guess that some people probably feel that way. But in reality, if you think about the implication, the implication is that statins eliminate your chance of having a heart attack or dying early, which we have very few medical interventions that absolutely eliminate the risk of a problem in the future. They reduce the risk in some people, but not all. When you're thinking, asking the patient about their expectations, you need to temper their expectations about the likelihood of benefit. And we'll get into that as as it relates to STEM. We're going to talk about absolute versus relative differences. And we do this math all the time when it comes to money. So I just give you a, a bit of a ridiculous example. So imagine you go and you're in the market for a used car. You go see Nathan Salami. He's the the local used car dealer and he offers you a deal. He says the car, this beautiful 1977 Pacer, he says it's 30% off the regular price. Now, how many people would agree to buy that? So if you want to put your answer in the chat or no, so a lot of no's and that's correct. And if not, why are you saying no? What is the reason? So as someone has pointed out, you need to know the original price. So if he was saying, well, the original price was $500,000 and it's 30% off, then, you know, it's just over $350,000. It would be ridiculous. But if he said, yeah, the starting price was a thousand bucks and now it's just like 650 bucks, then you might, if you like pacers, you might be more willing. Kind of like the example that our keynote speaker had presented. So understanding the, the relative differences and the absolute differences and what's presented in clinical trials is incredibly important. So here's an example of a, a lipid ad that appeared and it says Lipitor reduces the risk of heart attack by 36%. And the reference is to a paper that in a more eloquent way discusses the whole issue of relative and absolute differences. But let's just focus on the fact that they're implying that Lipitor reduces the risk of heart attack by 36%. Our rule of thumb is anytime you see a number where they say there's a certain percentage risk reduction, I just assume that they're talking about a relative risk reduction until I can prove otherwise. Because usually they're going to present the relative number, which is bigger. In the case of the used car example I gave, the 30% reduction in the cost of the car 
sounds better than what the absolute reduction might be. So it's more motivating for someone to consider a treatment or a sale if you use the relative numbers versus the absolute numbers. So my starting point is I just assume it's relative and I need to figure out if it's the absolute or not. And in this case, in the ad, when they were talking about a 36% reduction in MI, and you go to the, the fine print in, and, and you pulled up the clinical trial, what you would see is that placebo patients had a 3% rate of myocardial infarction. The atorvastatin patients had a 2% rate of myocardial infarction. And so the absolute difference is that the difference between 3% and 1%. Just like saying if the car was $500,000 down to $250,000, that's a 50% reduction versus the car was $1,000 and now it's $5. That is also a 50% reduction, but the absolute difference in price is $250,000 in the former and $500 in the latter. So very different, right? Same relative differences, big differences in absolute. So in this case, the absolute risk reduction for stat versus placebo is only a 1% difference. It's a 36% relative reduction, but a 1% absolute reduction. So that tells you what is the absolute chance of benefit. You still need to ask how many people are likely to experience that benefit. And if your patients, like you said in the poll, most people expect sort of an elimination of the risk. In this case, it's a different outcome, but they may assume the same, that my risk of an MI in the future is eliminated. Then you need to correct that assumption. So you take the absolute risk reduction, you divide it into 100, and it tells you what the number needed to treat is. So the number needed to treat in this example is 100 divided by 1%, which equals 100. So for every 100 people that take a statin daily for three years, one will not have an MI that can be attributed to the benefit of the statin. The other 99 people will not benefit from the statin. Some of those people will go on to have myocardial infarctions. Some of them won't. But the people, uh, the only person that will not have an MI, there'll be only one person that won't have an MI that can be attributable to the effect of the statin. So here's an example where I want you to look at the graph and look at the text and work through it in your head. So I'll give you about a minute. This is a trial of atorvastatin versus placebo in patients with cardiovascular, a risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So in the text, it says allocation to atorvastatin was associated with a 37% reduction in the incidence of major cardiovascular events. They go on to say, we observed a reduction of 36% in acute coronary events, 31% in coronary revascularization, and 48% reduction in stroke. So in the chat, can you tell me what the absolute risk reduction was for cardiovascular events, acute coronary events, and stroke? All the information you need is in the figure on the right. So if we're looking at acute coronary event, you'll see that they go from 5.5% in the placebo group to 3.6% in the atorvastatin. So you take that difference. If you are talking about the primary endpoint, it would be a di the difference between 9% and 5.8%. And if you look at stroke, they're talking about a 48% reduction, which is actually an absolute reduction of 2.8% minus 1.5%. Okay, and I can see people doing the math and doing the numbers needed to treat, which is excellent. So for acute coronary events, they're talking about a 36% reduction. So that's actually the difference between 5.5% with placebo and 3.6% with atorvastatin. So an absolute difference of about 2%. So the number needed to treat is about 20 over three years. So it tells you that what is the absolute difference in the risk of developing an acute coronary event with atorvastatin? And how many people do you need to treat to benefit one. And you need to treat 19 people for one to benefit. Now, I, I'll tell you, I've given this information to friends that have asked this question. And I'm surprised because to me, I don't think this is a meaningful event. But some of the people I share this with says, oh, that's a, that's a reasonable expectation for a medication. I'm going to take the stat. And I'm surprised. And then other people will look at the same information and say, it's not enough of an effect for me. That's not success for me. I'm not willing to pay or take the chance of side effect. I will not take the that. Both people are answering the question correctly. They're doing it based on the facts and their values and preferences. So I think that's fine. For stroke, they report the 48% reduction. Again, that's the 2.8% minus the 1.5%. So the absolute difference is 1.3%. The number needed to treat is 77, as you can see the math there. So you need to treat 77 people for one to benefit. One per 
person will benefit and the other 76 won't. So when the patients are saying or thinking potentially that statins will eliminate their risk, you can use this calculation and information to say the odds of benefiting are one out of 77. The odds of not benefiting are 76 out of 77. Some people will like those odds and some people won't, but those are the facts. Aaron, I think we're, there's some questions about the math. Oh, sorry. Uh, Dawn <laughs> yes. is asking. Yeah, the math is wrong. It should be 50. Okay. Uh, 100 divided by 2 is 50. So it should be 50. And then subsequently, okay. it would be 1 benefits and 49 would. Yeah, sorry. Just so people are, are not to, to don't. And, and the point is not to worry about the math, but just mm-hmm. to help you uh, put this all in perspective. And and remember, these numbers are in diabetic people, not di- non-diabetics. So these are these numbers looking better than than for the general patient population. Um, and there's a comment about, you know, but the cardiologist said I should be on it. Yeah, that I hear that comment all along. But the point of this yellow box is to remember to ask the patient and reflect on the discussion about the PICO question, what's important to them and say, if you need to treat 50 people with a statin to prevent one person from having an acute coronary event, one person will benefit, 49 won't. How do you feel about that? And do you have any other questions about the risk of side effect and the cost? And there's a question here. Does doesn't it depend on the baseline risk of patient? You're very correct, uh, Josh. So what Jessica was saying at the beginning is, does the evidence from the clinical trial that you're reading say anything about the kind of patient that's sitting in front of you? And so that reverse PICO concept that she was talking about is, if the patient in front of you doesn't resemble at all anyone that was included in this clinical trial, then you're going to have to preface the discussion and your interpretation with the kind of person I'm trying to help is not represented in the evidence that I'm using. So I need to make sure that I understand that and the patient understands that. So if your patient represents the kind of patient in the clinical trial and they have similar baseline risks as the trial participant, then it's likely that the the evidence from the trial applies to them as well. Uh, we're going to go to the Slido here and do a little bit more about diabetes. So this this is not exactly what Harvey's asking, but what are you thinking uh, when you're figuring out what is the most important measure of good diabetes management? Is it the preprandial di- uh, glucose being in a specific range? Is it having an A1C that's less than seven? Is it an A1C at an individualized target? Or if a patient doesn't go on to need dialysis or, or amputation? Okay, well, uh, why don't you just uh, put your answers in the chat? Do you think the preprandial glucose will say A, B, C, D? Um, the A1C less than seven. Chen says not needing dialysis amputation. We got individualized target C, patient autonomy honored less than seven. Okay, we've got one B there. Lots of different answers. I, um, no one's saying A. That's an interesting commonality. HbA1c not needing to see a doctor. I like that one, Mark. There's all different metrics, and you know, a lot of our questions are kind of facetious, right? They're they're not going to have perfect answers, but we're curious about your knowledge and your and your thinking and your thought process. In BC, the focus of glycemic goals is on achieving target A1c levels, and most of the BC guideline really emphasizes targets, but it also talks about adjusting them to be appropriate with within the specific circumstances of the patient if they're frail and demented being less less aggressive. So the again, this is from Diabetes Canada and DPAC guidelines, it really emphasizes A1C being to target. Okay, so there's lots of drugs that lower A1Cs, like sulfonylureas can can lower A1C by about one and a half percent, which sounds pretty good. SDLT2s can lower hemoglobin A1Cs, uh, but only a tiny bit. So they're probably not as good as sulfonylureas, right? That's the logic. If in diabetes, if we use this glucose specific theory that high sugars cause damage, when there's more damage, we have more bad outcomes. So high sugars cause bad outcomes. And so then drugs that lower sugar sugars should lead to fewer bad outcomes. And those that don't really impact our average sugars, our A1Cs very much probably won't reduce bad outcomes. Well, as you all know, and you might, oh yeah, even <laughs> you have stuff in the chat about diabetologists trying to get your 95 year olds A1Cs under 7%. But there's a problem, right? What patient, I mean, some patients are taught to care about their numbers, but what patient actually cares about their numbers? Not really. Uh, any of the ones that I know, they want to, they want to not die. They want to not have their leg cut off. They want to not be on dialysis. Those are usually 
usually the things that matter to patients. And this is a really huge network meta-analysis by Xi et al. Um, Gordon Guy was involved. And you'll note that when they compared all the different drugs for diabetes, they didn't even mention A1C, which is interesting. And you'll see that some of the newer drugs have quite favorable outcomes, even though they don't lower A1C that much. They have lots of harms too, but compared to some of the older drugs, which might have more impact in A1Cs, you know, those older drugs just didn't see, seem to have significant clinically relevant, and but also statistically relevant impact on some of these things, which really do matter to patients. I know we're, we're running out of time, so we're almost done. I'll just tell you briefly about surrogate. So how can it be that uh, a drug that lowers A1C radically doesn't impact real outcomes and that the opposite is true? Well, it's because A1C is a surrogate or proxy measure. It's not a, you know, it could be any one of the following. It could be a true risk factor that actually links to the outcomes that matter. An A1C that's um, lower at times, higher at times, it could be just an, an early manifestation of some kind of end organ damage thing that matters. Or it could be what uh, John Yudkin calls a uh, bystander. So these are chemical changes that don't really have an active role in the disease pathway, but they seem to correlate with some sort of clinical outcome and happen to mark the response of, of therapy. So one last question for you is to see if you have any other surrogate markers that, that come to mind where you're practicing practice has changed when we stopped emphasizing the surrogate. Lipids, that comes up, ACR is one. So when I think of lipids, you know, there was a comment before about, oh, we got to target the LDL, get the LDL lower. Thinking has gradually shifted to the, no, you can put a person on a statin and never measure their cholesterol again. And that might be sufficient. Bone mineral density. Yeah, that's a huge one. Yeah. So there's been lots of changes. I'm sure we could brainstorm many other examples. I think the last thing we're hoping is that you would do the final quiz here, which is the same questions as at the beginning and those yes or no answers. See if your thoughts changed. So this is about, should I take gabapentin? Is the PSA test a good idea? Should I take a cholesterol pill? And should I be on a, one of those new diabetes drugs? And it might be interesting for you to ref reflect on that. We'll save the responses and we'll use that to help us tell if our uh, discussions today seem to have any impact. And Aaron, I think I'll go to our conclusions. Sure. And this is just a summary of uh, what we've already said. Uh, thanks, Jessica. So again, taking the time to sort out your PICO question and get some input from the patient will help you sort out your thoughts and help you interpret the evidence later on. Ask the patient what matters to them. And, you know, these four pitfalls that we've outlined that are listed here on the slide are uh, some of the many things that you need to be aware of. But this, these four come up often and it takes some practice in getting used to doing the math and looking out for these things. But it's, it's definitely worth the time and will make your interpretation of evidence more likely to get you to the truth. So we hope you found this useful. Thanks, everyone.